Well, thank you everyone for coming here so late in the day. I don't know about, about you all, but I am very confused about what time zone it is. I woke up, I, I'm from Colorado. I woke up Saturday, or went to bed Saturday night in the mountain standard time zone, woke up in the mountain daylight time zone, and then flew to Pacific Standard, which is actually the same as Mountain, no, wait, Pacific Daylight, which, yeah, I don't know what time it is. <laughs> All right, my name is Rich Rue. Um, I'm in charge of uh, developer APIs for the Utility Network and Geodatabase. I'm here today with Jennifer Neary. She works with us on the ArcGIS Maps SDK for Native Apps team and William Moreland, who is technically on the Geodatabase team, but has been working on the JavaScript API for the Utility Network. So today's talk is kind of a cross-platform survey of the different options that we provide for building um, Utility Network applications. So I assume at this point, given the hands at the beginning of the session, everybody knows what the Utility Network is. Um, you start off, you create a client-server database, you publish it to Utility Network, you, you publish it um, to feature services, and then you can query and edit this UN on, on multiple platforms. So again, what we'll talk about today is the different options. Um, I am going to assume some basic familiarity um, with the Utility Network and its information model. If you're viewing this at home later, there's a little link here um, that will take you to a recorded session from the, the the dark days of the 2020 pandemic um, Dev Summit. But the good news about those dark days is that we have all these YouTube videos where you could go and watch, watch the session. So it's good to go back and look at that if you're unfamiliar with the terminology. We're gonna start with just a technology overview and then we're gonna talk through um, various aspects of the APIs. So starting with the technology overview, I, this is I'm sure old hat to just about everyone here. Um, for desktop ArcGIS Pro, we have the Pro SDK that allows you to build um, utilities and things with, with uh, C-sharp. On the server side, we have the Enterprise SDK. On the web side, we have the Maps SDK for JavaScript. And of course, on the mobile side, we have Maps SDK for native apps. So the Pro SDK, um, most people use it for add-ins. And add-in is like adding a button or a tool or a pane to the ArcGIS Pro interface. Um, the other things you can do with the Pro SDK, though, is you can create what's called a configuration, which allows you to modify the Pro UI in general. You can also write a core host application. This is probably the second most popular. Um, a core host application is basically a command line app. Fairly limited functionality, but you can do things like um, edit data and, and stuff like that. And finally, you can create what's called a plugin data source. It's kind of outside the, the realm of today's talk, but it allows you to create, allows you to access a custom data source that ArcGIS Pro otherwise wouldn't be able to read. On the native app side, um, we have a number of different SDKs. Um, actually, I think there's a fifth one now, but I don't remember. I wasn't, did we announce that? The fifth one this morning? It, doesn't matter. Um, the, big ones, the big ones are .NET, Swift, Kotlin, and Qt. Um, .NET and Qt can be used to build an app cross-platform, whereas Swift is you know, more for your iOS devices and Kotlin is for Android. Um, on the website, we have the Maps SDK for JavaScript. And what's interesting about this API is that, as you probably know, everything in the utility network goes through a REST API. So if there are places in the JavaScript API where we don't yet have complete support, you can always do that little end run around and just use the REST endpoint directly. So that's an interesting thing. It makes it a little bit different. Now, the ArcGIS Enterprise SDK is something that not too many think people think about. But the idea is that you can build a piece of code that sits on the server side the Enterprise SDK itself is very similar to the old Arc Objects. Who, who remembers Arc Objects? A couple, oh yeah, oh yeah, you guys are my friends. Um, support for .NET and Java for this. Um, the two main kinds of, of uh, extensions you can build on the server side are what are called server object extensions. 
And what this does is it allows you to create a custom REST endpoint that your custom app can call and a server object interceptor. And a server object interceptor basically intercepts a call to one of our REST endpoints and you can do either pre or post processing in that call before you pass it or after you get the result back um, from the server side. You can even use the two in combination. I'd be remiss if I didn't mention some other ways um, that you might use to build utility network functionality. There are, of course, attribute rules. Uh, These are just arcade scripts that are fired when edits take place. You can use Python and geoprocessing for many tasks. And if all else fails, you can go directly against the REST API. All right, so now what I'm going to do is I'm going to kind of walk through the different areas, and I'm going to start with the most boring and uninteresting one, which is schema. And I say that because it just isn't exciting. But, you know, one of the, one of the great strengths of the utility network is we have these, you know, recommended data models, but there's no reason that you can't change that data model. There's no reason you can't create your own entirely from scratch. The software doesn't care. Um, what applications need to do, though, is they need to be able to read schema information to write their tools. So, for example, if you want to identify transformers, you probably want to look for a category called transformer on, you know, the asset groups and asset types in your system. And the way to do that is through these utility network schema classes. So all of our platforms provide technique to read the schema. Most of them support all the schema, but there's some, some limitations that I'm going to mention. Um, this is kind of a, a class diagram, if you will, pseudo class diagram showing the different types of schema. We start with the utility network. There are network sources and asset groups and asset types, and I won't read through the whole thing, but this is the full span of information that's available that your app can query um, to find out more about the particular data model in use. So in Pro, you start with the utility network class. There's a get definition method on there that returns a utility network definition object. And from that, you can then drill down into all the different schema options on that previous page. With the native maps SDK, very, very similar. There's a utility network class with a definition class next to it. Um, Couple changes we have added in the past year, support for rules and rule elements. So the utility network rules are like what, what asset type is allowed to connect to um, other asset types or you know, what devices can be attached to a structure and things like that. So it's those structural attachment, connectivity, and uh, containment rules. Other than that, some of the subnetwork stuff, some of the terminal configuration properties aren't yet there. We'll be adding them shortly. The JavaScript side is a little bit weird. Um, we only provide access to a limited number of information as classes. Um, we provide the domain network names, system layers, terminal configurations, and terminals. And these are the things that we're, you're most likely to use. Now, of course, everything else is there. But what we do is we just give you the full JSON, and you have to go through and parse that JSON, which, you know, if you're a JavaScript developer, that's a Tuesday. Um, on the enterprise SDK side, um, it starts off from the utility network. There is a interface called IDE, utility network. DE stands for data element. And from that, um, there are categories and terminal configurations and domain networks and, and so forth that you can navigate down through. Of course, on the server, you get access to everything. All right, view and query. This is where things get a little bit more interesting. Um, displaying features, you know, at, at, in, in one way, features are just features. You display them on the map like anything else. Um, but we do have some extra um, methods to display feature data with the utility network. And the first of these is what's called a subtype group layer. You've probably used them in Pro. Um, it's a group layer with a sublayer for each subtype, for each asset group. Um, basically, it gives you full control over symbology for each, of those, um, for each of those asset groups. If you remember from the UN, um, for performance reasons, we took various, what in the GN were disparate 
feature classes like fuses and transformers and switches, and we jam them all in one feature class to, perform, to improve performance. Nevertheless, you probably want different fields and different symbology for fuses, switches, and transformers. Now, on the native maps SDK side, I want to make everyone clear that it is critically important that every map have one layer per utility network feature class. And that's because of the way that um, the native maps SDKs take data offline. Um, we'll have a talk later this week, tomorrow actually, where we'll go into details about why that is and, and how that works. Display filters, display filters, you know, from a UN context allows you to show and hide features while keeping them. Um, you can still select them, but they're not visible. That's what we use to implement the show hide containment um, option in, in ArcGIS Pro. So programmatically, um, for the most part, we have full support for all of these things. The exceptions is the JavaScript API doesn't really support our display filters yet. And um, to get to display filters through Pro, you have to go through what's called the SIM model to get to that information. All right, web maps. So web maps are this thing that has been quietly being evolved over the last few releases. So starting at Pro 2.6, web maps support subtype group layers. Starting at 2.9, display filters are stored in there. What's interesting is that Enterprise 11.1 added some basic support for subtype group layers. We enhanced that at 11.2, and coming at 11.3, even more enhancements. So the, you know, when, when web maps, when, when the utility network was first released, there were no um, subtype group layers in web maps, so people had one map they used on the web and one map they used in Pro. You no longer need to do that. Map Viewer now has excellent support for them. Given that, um, you can always create a utility network from a URL or from a database or something like that, but we can also get the utility network from the map. So in Pro, there's a utility network layer, and the native maps SDK and JavaScript have additional properties that will let you um, get the utility networks that are in a particular map. Now, you notice it says utility networks. In theory, you can have multiple UNs in the same map, which your, your organization might choose to do. You might choose to put gas and electric in, in two different UNs. You don't have to. You can put it in one and have two domain networks, but it's definitely a possibility. So for associations, you know, this is something above and beyond just displaying a, a, a feature on the map. You, know, you want to know, given a feature, what other features are associated with that. Um, we have support across the platform. There's a number of different queries you can do to, to, get, to get those associated features. Association geometries, you know, that's the, there's a little tool in Pro that will let you, that you can toggle on and off. Um, that is also supported across the platform. Um, different, different routines on all of them. Worth pointing out that we have a view associations widget in JavaScript. So you can just add that to your map and it you know, allows you to toggle those associations on and off. Finally, we have association traversal. This is a fairly new thing. It is really only useful if you're building a telecom application, but the idea is to allow a multi-level traversal of a whole set of associations in one call to the service. Um, this particular example here is showing a a splice enclosure, which has different trays and connector groups and splice points and fibers. And using the Pro SDK or using REST, you can go through and extract all that information in one call. And that's called Traverse Associations. So that'll eventually be coming to the other platforms as well as um, the need for more telecom functionality makes it to those platforms. Okay. Analytics. Analytics, of course, is good old-fashioned tracing. We support a number of different traces in the utility network. Um, if you've ever pulled up the um, tracing geoprocessing tool, you know there is a ton of different options in there. There are basically classes to go along with each of those options. The big one, of course, being the trace configuration class, but there's other things as well. 
Um, one of the interesting things about the, all the APIs is there's these different result types that you can pass in and get different kinds of results back. It's um, entirely customizable on all platforms. And in the Pro SDK, we actually have 37 different classes dedicated to tracing. Um, in the JavaScripts Maps SDK, you have um, everything there is available through JSON. Um, the native Maps SDK, almost everything. We haven't we haven't taught the native Maps SDKs about subnetworks yet. You can do a subnetwork trace by like placing a starting point and doing either a subnetwork trace or an upstream or downstream. But there's no way to list the available subnetworks yet. So that trace isn't yet there, but it will be. Now you can go through all of that. Um, you can also use what's called a named trace configuration. Um, basically, you can create a set of trace parameters in Pro, publish it to the server, um, and that will be accessible across all of the APIs. So it's kind of like a pre-built trace where all you need to do is change the starting points um, and any point barriers you have. You can also configure it on a web map. So why would you do that? Well, your UN may have, you know, 15 name trace configurations, or maybe it's 100. But you create a map just for storm restoration. And then you can select which name trace configuration do you want available to users of that map. And then your application can just read that list of traces and present those to the users. The nice thing about this, first of all, it's cross-platform. Um, it also allows traces to be independent from the data model. So if you're a business partner and you have a dozen different clients and they all have slightly different data models, you can create one trace, say valve isolation trace, and you can create a different definition of that trace in, for each of your 12 customers, but your app just calls the name trace configuration named Acme Valve Isolation, or assuming your name, company name is Acme. Um, Additionally, you know, as the data model changes, you can change that trace without changing any code in your system, which is nice. Um, since you all raised your hand earlier as um, Arc Objects developers, you know, some of you still are looking for the iForward star. That is the way that with a geometric network, you can go from edge to edge or, or excuse me, edge to node, nodes to edges, and you can step through your entire network that way. Um, we believe that most basic traces can be handled by the trace framework we've provided. However, if you're doing some complex analysis, you might not be able to get away with that. Of course, the problem is us coming up with an API that will scale and work with web services. We don't want every time you go from an edge to a node or a node to an edge to make another call to the service. That would be very, very bad and slow. So on the client side, there's a couple ways to work around this. Um, we can return the connectivity information as a JSON string. Either the trace geoprocessing tool allows you to do that. There's the trace rest endpoint. And starting at Pro 3.3, there's a new method on the tracer called an export. And what that will do is you pass in the name of a, of a file location. It will take the trace and return it as a big JSON string and stick it in that file for you. So, you know, if you're doing an entire city, that could be a really big JSON file to parse and deal with. But if you're doing a much more limited query, say the contents of a, of a transformer bank or something like that, you might be able to just parse that, you know, parse that small file and then go to work. Now, another thing to worth considering is using the enterprise SDK for this. Because on the Enterprise SDK, we do provide full access to fine-grained network topology. So you can do what's called a network query, um, the iUtility network query interface. And then there's different um, methods and different interfaces to, to query associations and adjacent elements and so forth. So we are, um, I'll do a little bit more audience participation. One idea we are thinking about for the future is the ability to create a, um, an extract of a network, bringing it down locally, and then providing full topology for that. So I don't know if that's something that people would be interested in or not. Could be used offline, yeah? 
Yeah, the idea, the question was, would it be used offline? And the idea is yes, we would extract a, a section of the network, bring it down into a replica, give you full access. So you could, you know, in theory, if you wanted to do an analysis of a subnetwork, you could bring the subnetwork down, do your analysis, take your results and send it back up, something like that. So, okay, so a little bit of interest, good. Um, another way to visualize your network is with network diagrams. Currently, the Pro SDK is the only one that does it. Um, native SDKs in JavaScript can leverage the REST APIs. And of course, on the Enterprise SDK, um, you can get access to everything. Who, who here is interested in taking network diagrams and putting them on the web or, or taking them offline? Got, okay. Actually, quite a few hands. That's good. Got to hear it. Right now in the Pro SDK, you can create and edit diagrams, and you can also create your own custom layouts. All right, editing, and then finally I'll get a chance to rest. Lots of different aspects in, in, involved with editing. Um, immediate attribute rules. Most of you, I'm sure, already know about this, but these are the rules that fire when edits are made. So you can do a calculation rule, which will update a value in the, in the feature. You could do a constraint rule, which will do a check. Um, they're all written using Arcade. They all can run cross-platform. Um, we do have great platform support for these things. Now, in Pro, we added a new API at 3.2 to provide access to the schema. So you can now check to see what attribute rules are there. As before, they fire automatically. Um, the only other thing I want to point out is that with native apps, if you take a replica offline, the rules will fire. Right now, they'll fire at sync time. We're not yet taking attribute rules out into the field. That's something that's on the way. Um, one of the implications of rules firing at sync time is you want to be really careful about constraint rules. Because if a constraint rule fails, you're not going to know about it until the mobile user does a sync. In that case, we really recommend you use what's called a validation rule. Those are batch rules that you can run back in the enterprise to make sure your data is correct. Contingent values provide a value of valid values depending on either the subtype or by other values. That's so that when you select um, a wood as your material for the pole, um, you can have paint or creosote as your, uh, your treatment type. But if you change the pool's material to paint, creosote no longer shows up as a valid option because that would be messy. Um, these, these rules are enforced at the editor UI level, not the geodatabase level. In Pro, no API form, but it all works if you're using the attribute inspector control. Maps SDK for native apps has full support both online and offline. Um, in JavaScript, we have both API plus forms automatically takes it into account. And as I said, it's a UI capability, so it doesn't really apply to enterprise. Association deletion semantics, clearly named by a PhD. It was. Um, the idea here is if you delete a container or a structure that have associations, different behavior can take place. Um, these are supported everywhere automatically, so that's nice. Association editing, the ability to add and delete associations, connectivity, containment, and so forth. Um, Pro SDK has support, Enterprise SDK has support, Native apps not yet supported, but it will be um, coming out later this year. And for JavaScript, we just added support in the 4.29 release, which came out February? Last month, right at the end of February, I think. Basically. Yep. Five, six. Um, validating topology and dirty areas. You know, when you make an edit, it creates a dirty area. and that indicates to the system that the network topology is out of sync with the features. Validate goes and cleans it all up. So for dirty area management on the native app side, it works when you're connected to a feature service. Um, we have some new APIs that we provided at 200.3. That was the release from December. That allows you to get access to that network state and the dirty area layer automatically. Um, if you're editing a offline replica, those dirty areas are created at sync time. JavaScript and Enterprise SDK, it, it just works. 
Um, in terms of validate network topology, most of the platforms support it. Um, a new API at runtime, uh, runtime, I can't say runtime. Native apps 200.3, um, when you're connected to a feature service, we now have a, a routine that will let you validate the topology. Um, no offline support yet, but that is coming later this year. On the JavaScript side, sometime around the middle of the summer, I think it was, um, we added a new user interface widget for that. In fact, you saw Jose use that in the plenary this morning where you just click the button and the dirty area disappeared. Now, batch attribute rules are interesting. These are those rules that you can run um, either as part of, part of a batch process with the calculation rules, or you can run what are called validation rules. You can run these rules on a selection. You can run these rules on a, uh, a difference query between your version and default. They're kind of like that last, last stand to get the data in a good state before you reconcile and post. Um, right now, these are only supported in the Pro and Enterprise SDKs. Um, certainly, you can do it in JavaScript via REST. I think we're probably more inclined to add it to JavaScript. Honestly, we tend to think of these things as a back end, as a back office kind of thing. So runtime support will probably come, come later. I said runtime again, didn't I? Subnetwork editing, um, enabling and disabling features as a subnetwork source or running update subnetwork. Again, right now it's just pro and enterprise, but we'll be expanding um, access eventually to the other platforms as well. One other thing I want to mention is that if you use the Maps SDK for native apps with a standalone mobile geodatabase, so a standalone mobile geodatabase is a database that you create in pro you copy over and you sideload on to your device and use it with the native apps. Currently, we don't support editing of those. That'll be coming either later this year or early 2025. It's a nice little chart if you can print it out and paste it next to your monitor. And with that, my voice needs a rest. So I'm going to turn it over to William. And William is going to talk about tracing and editing using the Maps SDK for JavaScript. Yes, I am. And uh, just as an apologies, dealing with allergies and all that with the March and Palm Springs. <clears throat> so as we go through this, uh, you can easily see, I'll just focus here, you can easily see that we have a sample app built entirely with JavaScript and being backend by a feature service. We have our dirty areas and our utility network. We can even go so far as to look at what the symbology is. This is going to be important because we're going to find a switch. And we're going to edit it to run some traces. So already, let's first go ahead and version our data so that we can go ahead and make some changes. I'm going to select a version, and the, all the data that I'm currently showing has now been switched to that version. And we can go so far as to also activate a trace widget and start with a downstream trace. Now, I know a little bit already about that this is a, a line or a center line for our power. So I'm going to go ahead and to see where it, downstream where this is hitting. As I run the trace, you can see as it highlights everything that's downstream from that point. Now, that's very good and all, but let's go ahead and change some data here. So I'm going to go ahead and activate my editor widget, and I'm going to select a switch. Let's see, it's uh, 3147. <clears throat> that's a little magic number I remember. So we're going to go ahead and uh, find the device status, and we're going to open up that switch. As we go ahead and update it, we're going to see that a little tiny dirty area is formed. We have to go ahead and handle that before we can go ahead with our second trace. So we're going to validate our network topology. It's going to go ahead and validate that dirty area for us, and it's gone. Now I can go back. Let's just zoom out a little bit. I can go back, and I can activate my trace again. Again, want my downstream. I'm going to go ahead and put my starting point on this line here. Again, this is the line that's feeding a lot of the network. Uh, neighborhoods, not networks around here. I'm going to run it again and see that now we no longer are passing through that open switch. With this tiny little sample demo, we can go forward and do a lot of little workflows that you know, utility network apps can do. You open up switches, close switches, and just see how it affects your data. I think with that, I can pass it back to Rich. Before you turn off your mic, let me put you on spot a little bit and tell us a little bit about how you built this app. 
Well, um, <clears throat> you want me to show the source code? I don't need to do that. <laughs> well, I made use of many widgets that we have out today, as well as some, uh, I don't think we were making use of the new web components, but you could make this very same app with the web components that are coming out today and the widgets we have today in the JavaScript API. Every single thing you see here in the widget panel that I have open is a widget that we have available for you. And also the version management system here is actually a web component, one of the first ones that have been built for the new, uh, the, the, the new API as it moves forward. Sorry, I'm not sure what we're calling the new components. The idea, though, is that this is, this is a pretty simple app using a bunch of widgets that we provide out of the box for tracing, for editing, and for validating topology. Uh, yep. Did you do a build so the question was, um, with the validate, did that do a build subnetwork afterwards? It did not. It just did the validate network topology. Correct. Mm -hmm. Yes. The, the question was, um, can you do a trace if you haven't rebuilt your subnetwork? The answer is yes. The thing that update subnetwork will do is it will go through and update any attributes that are burned into the feature to tell you its subnetwork name. But in terms of the tracing, the tracing still works without needing to run update subnetwork. Yep. Yeah, so update subnetwork is a you know, great thing to do probably when you're finished editing, unless you're trying to symbolize based on subnetwork ID, in which case you want to run update subnetwork immediately. Thank you, by the way. Let's talk a little bit about taking data offline. Anyone interested in that? Yeah, okay, good. There's a couple different ways to take utility network features offline. Um, the first one is with a mobile map package. The second one is a standalone mobile geodatabase that I mentioned a few minutes ago. And the third is what we call a replica mobile geodatabase. So mobile map packages, um, these are created from a map in ArcGIS Pro. On the share tab, there's the package group. You click new mobile map package, um, and that can either give you a a map package, an MMPK file that is stored on disk. You can also um, publish it to a portal, and then users can download it from that portal. Now, mobile map packages don't support editing. They don't support sync. And unfortunately, they don't support utility networks either. Um, that said, um, you know, there are certainly use cases where you just want to take a map and put it out to the guys in the truck. And they may not need to know you know, they may not need to be able to do a trace. They just need to be able to look up and say, oh, yeah, this is, they click on a feature and you say, oh, this is part of the, the Blackhawk 101 subnetwork, or, you know, this poll ID is 5672 and I'm at the right, I'm at the right poll to do my inspection or something like that. So there's still use cases where you don't edit or trace. Now, standalone mobile geodatabases, um, you can build them using Pro. Um, like I said, you can, you, you basically just create it using geoprocessing tools. You, you, know, you run the create mobile geodatabase um, tool. You can populate it with copy paste or import XML or things like that. Um, again, these things don't support sync. It's just a copy. But you can take that, put it out on your native maps SDK devices. You can do view and query. You can do trace. And as I said right now, you currently can't edit. But that last piece is the important one, the trace part. Now, Replica Geodatabases is a mobile geodatabase created by feature services. If you're familiar with the REST API help page, it's basically the Create Replica um, REST endpoint. Now, there's three real ways to create those um, using the native maps SDKs. One is you can use what's called the offline map task. You take a, um, a web map, and it will create an offline map along with a mobile geodatabase replica that the map points to. Um, the second thing you can do is you can create a replica by itself using the geodatabase sync task. And the third thing you can do is you go to ArcGIS Enterprise to the portal. You um, pick up your map and you click on the offline map areas and you can download um, a, what's called a pre-planned map from that site. So for most utility applications, that is probably the technique we recommend the most. 
The reason is that replica gets created once, and then you know, your two dozen, 100, 300 field users can download that same replica and not have to create their own every time. Now, we have changed our options for replicas since we met last year, if you were here. There's now two kinds of utility network replicas that we can create. The first one, and, and this terminology is, is uh, a work in progress. Let's, let's say that, it's a work in progress, is a partial UN. And a partial UN has a number of system tables on there. And most importantly, we let you edit that. I've already, been I've already talked about the editing options. All those things are there. You know, the network rules are in place and so forth. The second kind of replica we can create is a full utility network that supports trace. So if you're using 11.1 or earlier, you could only create a partial utility network. If you use 11.1 with a series of patches that we released last summer, or 11.2 or the forthcoming 11.3, you can choose which of these to create. So if you have a partial utility network, you can edit it. You have full access to schema. You can view and query features. You can view and query associations. Full editing, bi-directional sync, and no tracing. If you go the other way with a full utility network, you have schema information, you can view and query features, you can view and query associations, but there is no editing and there is not yet sync. So the, it's a one-time download only, so it's like the full network, bring it down, and then you have full access to offline tracing. Now, if anybody gets grumpy at these two options, please, please rest assured we're grumpy about it too. And we don't like this choices, and we'll talk more about where this is going um, in, in the coming year. So to give us a demo of that, I'm going to turn things over to Jennifer. Thanks, Rich. Can you hear me just fine? <laughs> All right. So in our last year's demo, we simplified our app development with the utility network trace tool. Did you know that this now supports traceable offline maps? So while we were online, while we were on Wi-Fi, we downloaded the offline area right here, which is what you're seeing on the screen. Um, the, we are now on airplane mode, so we're completely offline. This application was built with native apps and toolkit. Um, it is also configured to receive notification of gas mains due for maintenance, which is what we see here on, on the badge. Um, because we have the web map configured to have name traces, the trace tool on the right panel show traces that were shared with the map. So if we are now to process the uh, starting locations that we received from that notification, we can use the trace tool to review um, right here, we can also update the location. We can get more information about them, and we can discard the starting points that we don't need. So given a single starting point, we can choose a trace that will find us the, the valves that we need to close for this, this pipe's safe repair. So if we are comparing um, if we're doing any visual comparison between traces, what we want to do is color code the aggregated geometry result. So this time I'll choose red and run the trace. From that starting point, it found us the two valves that need to be closed for this pipe's safe repair. If I go back to the new trace and now choose a different isolation trace to find the customers that will be impacted by this downtime, I can color code that with blue. And now if I run the trace, notice here that we have the results from previews, which is the two valves that need to be closed, and the 68 customers that we now need to notify about this downtime. So what's involved? Let's see some code. Um, at the very minimum, when we create this utility network trace tool, at the very minimum is that we need to set the geo view, which is this property our map view. What this allows the tool to do is to add starting points and also display traced results. Sorry, do you see that better? 
All right, and if we are to search for um, for my map view in code, there's really only two places where the map content is set. Either we have a folder on disk, which is a mobile map package. We just open that mobile map package and we'll get an offline map. Or we may be getting it from an online source initially and then downloading that downla download offline job will give us an offline map. Um, if you join us in the Wednesday session, we will talk about how to download this map. Um, going back. So there are optional things that you can do. GeoView was the minimum setup to get uh, what's out, out of the box. But there are two events here. So for example, you can subscribe to Trace Completed Event. Since we are working with name traces, um, it may be important for you to know what parameters were involved. Um, so right here, it tells us the input parameters. Other than trace type, we have access to all the trace configuration, whatever filter barriers were used, we can get access to. Um, on a successful trace, we would get a result and there are three different types of, of results here. We can get an element result, a function result, or geometry result, and you may be wanting to display them or do your own process with those results and you have access to them via the trace completed. And you may also have access to warnings and for any exceptions that have occurred, for example, you're tracing across dirty area, you will get that exception here and you'll get the exception code and message details. Um, the other event that we subscribe to is the utility network change. So as Rich mentioned earlier, you may have one or more utility networks that is active, but the utility network gives you access to network sources and the tables. In this case, we were getting the network source for the line table because we were building the starting points um, by doing a query on that table and adding the starting point programmatically. So the utility network trace tool is part of an open source toolkit and it's available in all the native SDKs. Back to you, Rich. Thanks, Jennifer. So one other op offline option that I think always bears repeating is that you can take utility network data offline using ArcGIS Pro. You can use mobile map packages just to view those simple features you can also use a standalone mobile geodatabase. And with that standalone mobile geodatabase, you can do tracing, but you can also do network diagrams. Now, technically, you can also edit this, but there's no easy way to get those changes back up to the enterprise. So the real answer there, of course, is replica support, and that's coming soon. But, you know, certainly when I worked with utilities, there were many who would be just happy with a little ruggedized laptop to take that out into the field and not use a phone or an iPad. Now, different apps, different users, you know, different, different devices, but this is definitely an, going to be a, a better option as well. All right, um, just to wrap this stuff up, you know, the utility network story continues to evolve. I would say the three biggest um, areas of focus over the next couple years, offline utility networks with the Maps SDK for native apps. We're doing a ton of work there. We'll talk more about that in a session coming up tomorrow. The Maps SDK for JavaScript, just because that was the last one we started. So we need to kind of catch up and add more support there. And network diagrams is the other big piece of thing that we need to support outside of Pro. So this is the, this is the, the list that you want to take a picture of this slide. Um, these are the other sessions we have this week about the different APIs. So the Maps SDK for native apps is tomorrow at 4. Uh, JavaScript is tomorrow at 5.30. We have an overview of the Enterprise SDK at 2.30 on Thursday. And finally, on Thursday, we have the Pro SDK. And that Pro SDK session is a little bit different. It's just going to focus on what's new since the last Dev Summit. 
Um, you can also stop by the spatial data area of the showcase. I'll be there. There'll be some other people there who are you know, good with general utility network questions. Speaking of questions, who has them? Okay. You mentioned earlier in mobile map packages only having one layer per feature class. Yes, yeah, so the question I had mentioned with runtime that you want to have one layer per each feature class in the UN. So yes, that means one device layer, one you know, structure junction layer, one electric line layer, and so forth. Now, the reason that is, and we'll go into this in more detail in the Native Maps SDK talk, is that the utility network keeps a, there's two reasons actually. The first reason is the utility network keeps a mapping between its network sources and layers. And if there's multiple layers, it doesn't know how to find it. So it just uses the first one, which is often wrong. And the second reason is taking maps offline. If you have two layers that point to the same table or the same layer in the feature service, you'll end up with two tables in your mobile geo database, and there's no way to sync those changes back and forth. But as far as with the, uh, the subtype layers, the subtype group layers, subtype group layers. Yeah. yep. Um, you can't also do grouping within that. Right? The, the question was can you do grouping within a subtype? It works, the subtype group layers in JavaScript and the native maps SDK work the same way they do in Pro. So you can, but yes, you have to put all your devices probably on top of all your lines. You can't like mix and match them. Right, but I can't split different. Correct, you can't split them up into different. Correct, yeah, you can't, you can't have um, two subtype group layers referring to devices. Then you run into the same, the same problem. Christian over there. The question is, is update subnetwork available through a widget or a component? Uh, no, it is not, not yet. You can call it, you know, from JavaScript, you can call it from REST. I guess you could if you're connected um, from, from the Maps SDK for native apps as well. Um, but there's an API for it in Pro. That's probably something else that should have been on the previous slide of what's coming. You had mentioned the support for REST in the utility network model. Is that everything utility network model, including editing? Yeah, so the question is, can you get to um, all of the utility network via REST, including editing? And the answer is yes. Um, on the feature service, there's a, there's a method called, a, a endpoint called apply edits. That's how all editing takes place against a feature service. The answer is, is there a, the question is, is there a um, plan to include flow direction in trace results? Um, the answer is, I'm gonna give a half answer to that, unfortunately. I will say that the Pro um, Maps SDK and JavaScript APIs will provide support for that as soon as it is in core. I know there's some proposals in place to, to provide flow direction. Um, the idea there is in, some people want to build their network so that you always draw it from upstream to downstream. So then for you just need to return the direction. You can figure out which way is up and down, et cetera. Um, so as soon as they provide that, we'll be wrapping it in the APIs. Yep. I think Pro will be first as it, as it usually is. Anything else? All right. Oh, one more. What is the, is there an idea of a time frame of when that could be? The, the time, you're, you're asking about the time frame for flow direction in core. I don't know if it's in 3.3. I'm sorry. Come, come, by, the, come by the showcase and, and ask. And okay. If, yeah, we'll, we'll find an answer for that. I, I don't know if it's this release or the release after. 
All right, well, thank you very much for attending. Um, please share your feedback in the app and looking forward to seeing you in some of these other sessions this week. Thank you.